I, I want to particularly thank uh, Narl and Buzz in particular for uh, having this great tradition of featuring research that uh, can be helpful to uh, all of you uh, as part of the conference. Uh, uh, hopefully, it's all going to be uh, in a form that uh, you can take uh, back with you and, and work with and uh, help you perform your, uh, your work even uh, better. So we have three great presentations, at least we have two. Uh, you will make your own judgment about mine. Uh, and uh, after each of them, we'll have a, a Q&A, so open it up for questions. Uh, there are really three different topics. Uh, we could pretend that they were all other than uh, all about uh, the business that uh, you all are in, uh, that there's some uh, close tie, but each of them takes a different perspective on, um, on the issues that uh, we're all facing. So uh, we all know the Q&A will be with these roving mics, and uh, why don't we get uh, started? So um, actually, I should introduce both of, of the speakers. Lori's going to be first. You, you probably all know her. Uh, her complete bio is uh, in your package, and I'm not going to go through it. But uh, she is a vice president for housing finance policy at the uh, Urban Institute and has done some great work here uh, with NARL. And then we have uh, Andrew Jakobovic. Uh, who is the Vice President uh, in policy, uh, for Policy Development at Enterprise Community uh, Partners. And I've known both of them for a long time. They do terrific work, and I look forward to hearing their presentation. So, Lori, I think you're first. Well, thank you very much for having me here today, and um, special thanks to Mark Willis for hosting this panel, for, to um, Nal and to Buzz Roberts, and also um, Nal was the sponsor of this research. They, you know, we were what Buzz and I were talking a while ago, and there's sort of a general agreement that before you could talk about CRA modernization, which is absolutely essential, you really need to know where you are now. Where is CRA credit coming from? What's generating it? What do the numbers look like? So we spent a fair amount of time sort of putting together all the numbers we could. And this is just a numbers exercise. Um, where is CRA credit coming from? What do we know as a starting point? Um, so I'm going to actually go through our results and then go, th and, um, go through um, how we got there. We actually used three different data sources for this. We used um, the FFIEC loan files. We used HMDA data, and then we cross-matched the FFIC loan files with the HMDA data. So our overall results, there were about $400 billion in lending that counted towards CRA. The largest volume of CRA loans comes from small business lending, followed by single-family lending. However, single-family lending is not much larger than community development lending, and the latter is far more impactful. Multifamily lending constitutes only 7% of residential lending, but accounts for 23% of the CRA credit. So you can see um, in this slide here that um, small business lending is the single largest category at $172 billion, followed by single family lending at $108 billion, and not much behind that, community development lending at $96 billion. Multifamily lending at $33 billion again, is, um, um, is about um, a third the size of single family lending, but it's much in terms of CRA credit, but it's much, much, much smaller in terms of um, overall lending. That is, it packs a much larger bang for the buck. And small farm lending is, is very tiny. I want to point out that here we what we counted as single family lending is all loans to either LMI borrowers or in LMI areas within assessment areas, multifamily loans to um, LMI areas within assessment areas. Now, obviously, there's some uncertainty about exactly what counts towards CRA. So if it's a high-end project in an LMI area within an assessment area, the examiner may say, oh, no, that doesn't really count. So there's some ambiguity about what counted, but we needed some rules for this. Um, small business loans, anything under a million dollars in an assessment area. Small farm, anything under 500000 in an assessment area. And we counted 100% of the community development loans. 
um, as we basically think that almost all of them count toward um, CRA. So that was so. This is the order of magnitude, and it sort of surprised us that small business was the single largest category. Now, when you look within the small business category, you find that it's very, very heterogeneous. That is, um, you know, this, this shows you the top ten originators, and you'll notice that the average loan size is very different across these originators. That is. Um, City and um, American Express and Capital One, all very, very large credit card um, providers have a very small average loan size because a lot of what is counting as small business lending under CRA is actually credit card lending to small businesses. And for this purpose, the entire line of credit counts, not just the drawn amount. At the other end of the extreme, um, you have... Um, you have some very, you have some, you have um, much, much larger average loan sizes. So, for example, um, PNC is basically ten times the average loan size of Capital One. Um, it's sixty-six thousand versus about ten thousand. Um, you'll also notice at the very bottom of this page uh, that shows you the. Let's see. I don't. I guess I don't have a. Do I have a little thingy on here? Yes. You'll notice here. Uh, the LMI share of small business lending is on the at order of around um, 20 to 24 percent, depending on whether you look at it by number of loans or by dollar volume. So, relatively small amount of this is LMI lending. Um, when you look at community development loans, this shows you the top 10 lenders, and you, ob you observe that. Um, uh, there's a wide variation in terms of average loan size. The top 10 lenders are um, co constitute about 21% of the total number of loans, 39% um, in terms of the dollar volume of loans. Um, as I mentioned, about 96 billion of CRA loans count annually um, for CRA credit. Let's actually look at what this look has looked like over time, and you can see that here. So the upper right picture shows you Total community development dollar volume, you can see it's gone up substantially. However, if you look over time, the number of loans declined substantially in 2010 and has been uh, sort of after the crisis and has been pretty flat ever since. An average loan size has gone up substantially. There's general agreement that um, community development lending is the most impactful part of CRA lending. But there is no differentiation between easier to do community development loans and harder to do community development loans. Everything sort of um, counts relatively equally, and that's something that demands a lot more study and attention. But certainly, you know, com community development loans are outsized in importance relative to the numbers, and they're pretty big in the numbers as well. Now let's look at um, LMI lending for banks versus non-banks. Uh, this shows you single family. This shows you single family and multifamily lending. If you look by loan count, what you find is that banks are 42% of single family lending, um, and they are 39% of single family LMI lending. Um, by contrast, um, in the multifamily area, banks are 88%, um, 87, 86% of. Um, Single family lending, I'm sorry, multifamily lending by loan count, and they are 89% um, um, in terms of LMI lending. So, ba so banks are much less important in LMI lending. Uh, they, that is, their, their share of LMI lending is lower than their share of overall lending than non banks. Now, you look at this and you say, well, gee, that's really strange. Non banks aren't subject to CRA. Why should non-banks do proportionately more single-family LMI loans than the banks do? That just doesn't make sense. Um, and the answer is that um, banks have basically mo um, moved back from government business substantially, and in particular, FHA business. So if you look at um, this chart, what you see is that, the, is that, bank, that non-banks are 85% of the Ginnie Mae market. That is, new Ginnie Mae originations are 85% non-bank. If you break that down into FHA and VA, 
on the left-hand side, on the left-hand slide, you'll find that FHA origination is 90% non-bank at this point. Uh, VA origination is still extremely high, 79% non-bank. That, con that con contrasts with about um, 52 or 53% for the GSEs. So just hugely non-banks um, non are hugely more important in the um, government lending market, in part because of fears about um, the False Claims Act. Now you look at this and you say, well, wait a second. When you um, FHA lending is very LMI intensive. If you look at the bottom of this page, you see that 43% of FHA loans uh, are LMI versus about 23% of VA and about 28% of conventional loans. So the reason that um, banks are so much less active in LMI lending in single family space is that they're just less active in FHA lending. Once you correct for that product mix and you sort of break it down product by product, you can see that there's almost no difference between banks and non-banks. But again, remember, no difference when non-banks are not subject to the CRA and banks are. By contrast, in multifamily space, banks are definitely more active than their non-bank counterparts and they're more active in LMI lending. And we'll see some more numbers on this in just a second. Um, this actually shows you um, single family and multifamily lending inside and outside of assessment areas. So a, a number of interesting implications on this slide. The um, first is that for single family lending, there's essentially no difference between lending inside, between the LMI share inside assessment areas and the LMI share outside of assessment areas. The two are virtually the same. By contrast, in multifamily space, banks do more LMI lending inside assessment areas than outside assessment areas, which is exactly what you would expect from CRA. That is, when you look at um, the bank, sh that is, when you look at the multifamily space, about 49% um, of their total um, lending within assessment areas is, um, by loan count, is. Um, LMI versus about 43% outside of assessment areas. So there is a definite, definite difference. So the bottom line is that, is that multifamily, it, um, actually, there's a lot more CRA bang for the buck in multifamily. First, multifamily is more important to LMI borrowers because more LMI borrowers tend to be renters. Um, second, um, banks do more LMI lending than non-banks. And thirdly, more of that lending is within assessment areas and is hence given CRA credit, which explains the fact that um, banks are 7% of total residential lending, but 23% of the CRA credit. Um, now let's actually look at large banks versus small banks. This goes to the topic we were just talking about. Um, Congressman Meeks was talking about is what should assessment areas look like. Here what you find is that larger banks actually do a higher percentage of their total lending within assessment areas because their assessment areas tend to be very national. So for large banks in single family space, and I should mention here that our definition of large bank here is over 100 billion, medium large 10 to 100, medium small 3 to 10, and small banks are under three. So we're using sort of a non-traditional definition, but one that sort of captures market realities. Um, so 83% of, um, of large bank lending is within, assess is within their assessment areas in single family space. It's sort of in the 50 to 60% cate area for the other ca size categories. In multifamily, it's 92% for the largest banks, 73% for the medium, for the medium large banks and sort of 55 to 60% for the other two categories. So larger banks do more of their lending within assessment areas than smaller banks do, a conclusion that definitely surprised us. We assumed that small banks would do more of their lending within assessment areas, the assessment areas being very local. Turned out that was wrong. Um, question, when banks lend to LMI areas, are they also lending to LMI borrowers or are they lending to more affluent 
um, borrowers within assessment areas. So this, um, so, th so in single family space. So basically what you see here is by loan count, more of the loans, um, so of the 30% LMI share nationally, 28% bank, um, bank share, 19, 20% uh, of that is um, LMI borrowers, 13% of that is LMI areas. When you look by dollar volume, the two are virtually the same. That is half of the dollar volume um, is to LMI borrowers. The other half is LMI areas, and obviously there is some overlap. So the question is, um, how much overlap is there, and how much of the L LMI area borrowing is going to LMI borrowers? And this slide answers that question. So if you look by loan count here, you can see that basically about 40% of the loans to LMI areas are actually to LMI borrowers within that area. If you look at dollar volume, it's about 25% of the loan count of LMI to LMI areas are going to LMI borrowers. That is 25% of the dollar volume. Uh, about 44% of the dollar volume are going to those over 140% of the AMI. So the question is, you know, you may not want to do something about that in the aggregate because obviously um, gentrify sort of um, helping communities um, by helping all residents of that community um, help, helps a lot. But, it, you know, for certain institutions who are making all of their loans to affluent areas, affluent borrowers in LMI areas, that's something that examiners may want to flag. But the numbers were very, very interesting on that. Finally, um, I want to talk about concentrations. Single family lenders are not very concentrated. So this is just the na nationwide numbers. You can see that Wells is the largest lender with a 5.2% share. Quicken is second also with a 5.2% share. The cumulative share of the top 20 lenders is about 31%. The cumulative LMI share of the top 30 lenders is about 28%. There's not that much difference nationally. When you look at individual markets, again, um, the markets are very, very unconcentrated. Um, so this basically shows you a number of markets and who the top lender is and what their share is. So for example, in a, um, in Baltimore, the top lender is Wells Fargo with a 6.3% share, 5.2% uh, LMI share. When you run your eye down the list, what you see is a couple of things. First, the only areas that are over a 10% market share in a single market is where that's sort of the home market for that lender. So for example, um, Quicken Loans in Detroit is a 14% share, Wells Fargo, um, um, in Minneapolis, um, because Wells, is, um, Wells and Norwest had merged at one point, is 10.6% market share. And Wells in San Francisco, the original home of Wells, was a 10.4% market share. So those are the only numbers over 10%. And in almost all cases, the LMI shares are not that much different than the, um, than the overall shares. By contrast, the multifamily lending is much, much more concentrated. And you can see that um, here. Um, so the single largest lender is J.P. Morgan Chase with an 18.8% market share, followed by Wells at a 2.5% market share, and then it trails off a lot. When you look in the aggregate, the um, LMI share is not too different than the overall market share. However, when you look in particular markets, you do see a lot of concentration. So for example, um, um, in Atlanta, in, um, in Los Angeles, um, J.P. Morgan Chase has over a 58% market share, 54% um, LMI market share. There are some cases where there are some differences between the um, overall market share and the LMI market share, um, but in any case, it's something that needs to be monitored when you have certain markets where certain lenders are just so dominant. Um, in addition, it actually calls for the need for information to make sure that the, um, that the um, lenders who dominate a market are also doing their fair share for the LMI part of that market. Um, one of the um, real shames is that Humza is collecting data on the number of units in multifamily properties, 
but they're only releasing the data in huge, in sort of aggregate chunks, 5 to 24, 25 to 49, 50 to 99, 100 to 149, and 150 plus. So you won't actually be able to tell how much is lent per unit, which would actually be very, very useful information. And they're only telling you the number of income-restricted units as a percent of the total. So again, you won't know the actual number of income-restricted units, even though the data is being collected. One of the things that um, come to modernization calls for is transparency. Well, here you have this, CM, but they want to balance the costs of transparency. They want to balance that against the costs of collection. Here, the costs of release are zero because you have already collected the data. And it seems like here's an area where you could provide transparency at low cost. So I would definitely encourage that. Um, so with that, let me actually go back to my introductory slide to conclude. Um, overall, um, approximately $400 billion of lending that counted towards CRA. The largest volume is small business lending followed by single family lending. Community development lending is just a hair smaller than um, single family lending, but it's much more impactful. Multifamily lending constitutes only 7% of total residential lending, but accounts for 23% of the CRA credit. Non-banks do proportionately more LMI lending than banks, explained by their dominance in FHA lending space. Banks do no more LMI single-family lending in their assessment areas than outside their assessment areas. Banks do more multifamily lending in LMI neighborhoods within their assessment areas than outside. Bank, large banks do more of their lending inside assessment areas than is the case for smaller banks. Um, a huge amount, that is roughly 60% of the single family loans in LMI areas are not to LMI borrowers. And multifamily lending exhibits much more lender concentration than single family lending, making transparency really important here. We want to make sure these lenders play a role in LMI lending that is similar to overall lending. So with that, let me conclude. Laura, thank you very much. Uh, fascinating here. <laughs> I guess it is. Um, so I, I wonder if there are any uh, questions people have. Uh, just raise your hand and a mic will show up there. In the meantime, Laura, this is interesting about the mix within LMI neighborhoods. Yes. So I'm wondering whether you looked at the mix of home ownership there, that how does the mix of lending to L, uh, low and moderate income households versus higher income correspond to the ratio of homeowners in low and moderate income neighborhoods? And, whether you have had a chance to look at that and whether you could look at that if you haven't. Um, so are they getting equal share of the existing yes, market no, in those I, neighborhoods? I, I understand. I, I, right. um, I'm trying to think about whether, let me think about whether we actually have the data to do it. The problem is getting the... Uh, ACS probably. Uh, hmm? ACS might. You, you could, you can do, you'd have to do it at a more aggregated level, so you'd have to do it like at a, at a Puma level. Yeah. But yeah, you can, you can actually do it at the MSA level reasonably yeah. easily. Yeah. I, yeah, a good suggestion. I'll put it on the list for next year. All right. Well, <laughs> thank well, you. Thinking about that, do we have a question? Yes, okay. over there. I, I can't see very well. Good. Hello, Esther Schlorholt at Boston Private Bank, and this is really, really valuable data. Thank you. It, it's um, very unusual to have such uh, significant data. This is point of time data, 2016. Oh, yes, I should have actually mentioned this is 2016 data. At the time we started this analysis, we did not have the 2017 um, FIFIAC loan file. Right. And so I think that it's also really valuable to do something that's longitudinal and to be able to show the trends that are occurring, uh, particularly around single family lending. And, uh, you know, having been around before 2008, um, a lot of these trends seem to be similar to the ones that built up towards that time frame, uh, at least in the Massachusetts area. So I just uh, want to suggest that that would be a valuable thing to look at to, to see the comparison between CRA-covered lenders and, and those that are non-bank, particularly as you highlight the FHA role. Thank you. Thank, no, thank you. you. So we have time for one more question, if there is one. If uh, Josh had his hand oh, up. Oh, all right. 
Yes, you can. <laughs> Josh, how are you? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, but we need it for the recording. Thank you. Okay, for the recording. Um, first off, on multifamily lending, I just want to say that there is an advance notice of proposed rulemaking issued by the CFPB. And I don't think the lenders in this room are negative on multifamily lending. But if you look at some of the non-bank comments, um, they kind of don't want to report multifamily lending. And you document in your study that multifamily lending is very important for CRA. So, you know, hopefully um, there will be some positive comments on the ANPR about multifamily lending uh, comment period through July 8th. Um, secondly, I wanted to ask on page 10 <laughs> on your medium large banks, um, inside assessment areas it's 29%. Outside of assessment areas, it's the LMI share. It's 20%. And so in other words, medium-sized banks, there seems to be an assessment area impact there that's maybe not for the other banks, not as much for the other banks. And I, I was I wondering. I think, um, you know, we basically have relatively few banks in that group. So oh, okay. we actually need to, um, so the cutoffs were tricky, and there's not a whole lot of the lending that's within those groups, and I think there were some individual bank anomalies. Okay. And then large banks, a lot of the, most of the lending's inside assessment areas, so maybe yes. that's, you know, one thing that's affecting those numbers. And lastly, you say that community development lending is more impactful than single-family lending. As kind of a practitioner, I don't, I don't completely understand that because I think they have to work together. You can't revitalize a neighborhood if you just have community development lending and the housing stock is going to pot. Likewise, if you're revitalizing the housing stock, people need a sh to go shopping, need grocery stores, need you know shopping malls. So to me, it seems like they both work together. I don't know if you're thinking about any sort of econometric study or any further study to kind of see how they work together. I think that's very interesting. And actually, let me pick up on your first point on um, the, AN the new ANPR for Humda. That is actually a really, really scary document with a fairly short um, time frame. And one of the things it calls for is not requiring the reporting of multifamily loans to non-natural persons. That is, no multifamily mm -hmm. loans to corporate, to corporate entities would show up in the HUMDA data if this goes through as proposed. And that scares the hell out of me because we think it's the... Because it's basic, yeah, so basically you're gutting multifamily lending in that ANPR, so I would urge all of you to write a comment letter on that. All right, well, Buzz, uh, you may have some comments on that later, I guess, uh, <laughs> on the uh, important uh, role here. So um, lots of great data here. Is this something that uh, is going to circulate the, the PowerPoint to sure. your members? Sure. They're in the packet. All right, okay, so all of you can be studying that uh, later today. Don't miss the, uh, the presentation. So now, Andrew? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark and Buzz, for inviting me. Uh, and thank you to Josh for sort of teeing up the, uh, the next sl set of slides I'm going to present uh, on neighborhood change, gentrification, and the like. Um, so, here we go. So I want everybody to kind of just think about, in your own minds, how you would define gentrification, right? Also, just show of hands, how many folks are sort of DC-based? How many of you would consider yourselves coming from a place that is high cost? So pretty much everybody in <laughs> the room, um, or people who aren't paying attention, uh, is my general sense. But in fact, um, Affordability is a challenge pretty much in every county in the country. Um, the number of households who um, are cost burdened, i.e. paying more than 30% of their income, either for rent or for their home ownership, um, exceeds 20% in all but sort of a narrow band of counties running sort of through the center of the county, sort of in the sort of west, uh, running from Canada down to the Rio Grande. Um, so anyway, think about defining gentrification. If you saw it, you'd sort of know it, right? But seeing it and being able to quantify it are two very, very different things. I don't want to say gentrification is like pornography, but it's kind of like you know it when you see it, but it's very, very hard to define. So there are a number of different definitions um, that folks have used. I've just sort of selected three here. Um, there's uh, the transformation of a working class or vacant area of the central city into middle class residential or commercial use. Uh, that's a set of researchers back in 2008. 
Um, a more recent study defines it as increases, more generally, as increases in household income, education, and or housing costs uh, in previously low-income central city neighborhoods. So you can see there's also a uh, geographic component, um, not just, again, sort of the central city idea plays in. So if you're in a rural area or an exurban area, uh, you may not be sort of gentrifiable. And we'll get back to what gentrifiable means uh, momentarily. Um, and then there's also a definition that says the process by which they're talking about gentrification is a sort of this ongoing um, process that plays out as opposed to sort of a point in time measurement, uh, which is really important because I think people recognize that neighborhoods are changing um, and that process is over a protracted period of time. The process in which neighborhoods with low socioeconomic status, so you've got both a start condition, uh, experience increased investment and an influx of new residents of higher socioeconomic status. Um, so there's a sort of this re relative change um, that also appears in a number of different gen uh, definitions. And the origin of the term gentrification um, it actually comes from London about the, mo the movement of the gentry uh, into these neighborhoods that previously did not see any gentry. And so the process of the gentry moving in is the gentrification of neighborhoods. So there's a little historical uh, background for you there as well. But the need to go from the sort of abstract definition, the sort of qualitative feel, to one that is readily easily defined, particularly in the context of CRA, as there's thoughts around being able to measure, right, the metrics about where you're investing, how you're investing, where to deploy capital, and where the capital is needed um, in this context is important to have sort of a set of metrics. So from moving from definition to metrics is actually a lot harder than you might think. Um, and so the questions are, well, how do you actually translate this through these qualitative measures? Um, I feel the place is different. I see that the people are different than they used to be. The products on the shelves are not what they used to be. Uh, in the local retail stores. How do we try translate those qualitative measures into quantitative ones that are readily usable uh, for programmatic decisions, for policy making decisions, for lending decisions? And one of the questions is in moving from those qualitative definitions to quantitative definitions, what gets lost? Um, and even the best quote unquote data are ultimately a proxy on some level for the intangibles that uh, and the lived experiences of residents in changing communities. So even when conceptions of gentrification are the same, right, the different criteria and variables can have a very, very different result, uh, very, very different findings about when and where and how often um, gentrification occurs. And so understanding why we get the results that we're getting, um, not just sort of seeing, oh, I saw the study and X percent of places are gentrifying or my community is gentrifying, but really kind of taking a step back and saying, well, what do they mean when they say gentrification? really to focus on the aspects of neighborhood change that we can monitor, that we can measure, that we can identify, that we can work with um, either to curtail or to support in a more equitable way is really important. Um, so understanding why we're getting the results that we're getting, asking the questions of well, when we see the word gentrification, what are we really trying to get at? Um, it's really critical. And so ultimately the measurement frames our perception about what gentrification is and what the consequences might be. Um, I think one of the really interesting questions is the question of change as dilution of a certain population, long-time residents in a growing population, in a growing area, as opposed to displacement of long-time residents. And the types of interventions that you might consider, or the capacity to intervene either sort of at a, at a policy level or on a lender level in terms of working with the community, are going to be very, very different if you're trying to capture uh, or to retain residents who might otherwise be displaced differently from residents who might no longer feel as comfortable in their own communities and the types of community development activities that you might support uh, might look very, very different. And so moving to this sort of metrics, and I'll, I'll show you a tool that we've developed uh, just to kind of highlight the challenges in coming to a single definition of gentrification and why it's important to move, I think, from a discussion of gentrification sort of in the abstract um, to a more nuanced conversation and a more engaged conversation with community uh, residents uh, and involvement uh, ultimately leads you to a more important conversation about neighborhood change and its impact on the residents and their lived experiences. So you can see that the variations and in measures incorporate different sorts of data sources, different sorts of time series coverage, different le levels of geographic specificity, right, over what space, right, is this neighborhood change playing out? Is it at the block level? Is it the building level? Is it at the census tract level, the census block level, um, or broader, right? Do you use a, a citywide measure of neighborhoods, right? Do you use those boundaries, which can be difficult to then match, match up against more public and more uh, national data sources, right? Are you comparing community change within a city, right? So you sort of see intra-city um, mobility, or are you really looking to compare across the entire nation? So you've got entire swaths of the country that might gentrify, 
um, and other swaths that are not even eligible, right? So you think about kind of, again, those rural areas that don't fit into that center city definition. Um, and so the start conditions and what is considered eligible to gentrify matters a lot in terms of ultimately what does then get measured as having changed at the end of your uh, measurement period. Um, and so just for example, here are three um, sort of well-regarded studies um, that take very, very different approaches to gentrification. And I share these not because any one of these should be taken as authoritative. In fact, I think the value of having this conversation is to realize that there are a whole slew of very, very different definitions, um, some of which use national numbers, some of which use area medians, et cetera, um, some of which look both at the start, start conditions very differently and then the end conditions, um, conditions required for gentrification. For example, the Freeman paper um, looks at not only ec uh, income levels, but also takes into account college graduates. Uh, a lot of folks have sort of used um, the, rate, the rate of uh, change in um, high education, uh, highly educated uh, individuals as a measure of sort of faster changing communities than, um, than others, which I think is really interesting. But there's also a question as to whether that's a leading indicator or a lagging indicator. Um, but at the end of the day, um, all of these measures lead to very, very different outcomes. So uh, I'm just to sort of see how those sort of actually play out numerically. Um, the Freeman paper, which takes a very, very broad view, right, the number of tracts eligible to gentrify at the start of any given decade, going back to 1970s, the 70s, the 80s, 90s, or back in 2000, um, and we sort of stop it at 2000 because we can measure from 2000 to 2010. So um, that sort of leads to a sort of, again, lag data um, in the ability to identify some of these places. There are other ways to do it with some newer data. Uh, ACS doesn't really let you get down as, as granular uh, as you would like for some of this, so you need to sort of proxy in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, the, the Freeman data, right, sort of basically has twice as many tracks that are eligible to gentrify. So even before you start the conversation about what has changed, right, if you're not eligible, if you don't fall into one of those numbers to start off, right, we can't then say, oh, you've, you've changed uh, down the road. Or we'd say you've changed, but we wouldn't necessarily call you as having gentrified. Uh, and so you can see that the number uh, for Freeman sort of starts high and grows uh, over time. Uh, the numbers for the other two uh, authors, the other two papers, uh, actually fluctuate a little bit over time, but on balance are about half as high. So when you move over to the number of places that have actually changed, um, we see that there's a lot more gentrification, quote unquote, happening uh, using the Freeman definition than either the McKinnish or the Eleanor Regan uh, definitions. And again, you see also a little more fluctuation um, in those uh, patterns over time as well. Um, and basically, you can st as long as you were sort of eligible to gentrify at the beginning of a, of a, of a decade, um, and then have changed to meet the conditions at the end of that decade, you have been counted as having gentrified. Um, so, but if then in the later decade you've sort of reverted back to your previous state, you would be eligible to gentrify in the next round. So there is some uh, set of census tracts that actually do bounce up and down over time, and whether you would sort of consider that successes and failures or just sort of the natural um, life cycle of communities over time, I think it is an important conversation to have as well. Uh, so shifting. Um, momentarily to the, um, the web, we have a, um, they're up, they're up. great. Um, I'm going to go to full screen on this. Uh, so uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Rachel Drew, has done some really terrific work on this, and this is um, something that's available. Um, I'm clicking on full screen and not get, there we go. Um, so what, uh, what she did is she took those different definitions and applied them to census tracts across the country. And so you can see here, this is um, Washington, D.C. in the 2000s, but we can kind of roll the clock back to 1970 uh, to see uh, the differences in, um, according to the different definitions, in terms of the level of coverage of eligible to gentrify. And what you see, uh, the, the white uh, uncolored areas are not eligible to gentrify at the start of each decade. Uh, the light green indicates that they were eligible to gentrify under the different definitions. And again, you can see um, the sort of more liberal definition, the broader definition of eligibility that Freeman uses um, compared to, in this particular instance, the McKinnish uh, seems to be the most conservative, and Eleanor Regan sort of fits in the middle there a little bit. Um, and then the number of tracts that by the end of the 1970s had gentrified, um, all of them find some, but again, uh, in the case of McKinnish, relatively few, Freeman quite a bit more um, had gentrified, and we can kind of play this forward to see how these places change over time. Um, again, sort of eligibility, um, and so taking it to the sort of mostly current state, uh, or as current as we have, right, you can see that 
over the course of the 2000s, between 2000 and 2010, right, tremendous uh, gentrification activity, pretty much half of DC uh, under Freeman's definition would have considered to have changed to the point where they would consider it uh, uh, having gentrified, uh, much smaller concentrations uh, for Eleanor Regan and even fewer for, for McKinnish. Um, and there's not necessarily disagreement either on the, um, N the different census tracts, right? You can see that the overlap is not necessarily the same. So it's not a guarantee that if you're going to use the Freeman definition, you're also going to, by the fact that it's more broad, you're also capture the exact same neighborhoods um, as the other two. Uh, so uh, turning back to the PowerPoint now, and that's available um, online on our website. Um, or you can just Google gentrification comparison tool that comes up, not surprisingly, as the first Google result. Um, oh. So. Um, so why it matters, right? Um, so I think it's really important to think about neighborhood change um, in the sense that gentrification is rarely a binary condition, right? It's not, oh, it used to not be a gentrified neighborhood and now it's a gentrified neighborhood and then we can sort of, in part because by the time you had made that, definition, that decision, right, it's sort of too late to intervene to, to help the folks who are living there and may be subject to pressures around rents um, and access. So um, it's rarely a, um, a binary condition. It can be gradual, right? The, the measurements that we have are over the course of decade or decades. Um, and it lacks clear start and end points, right? Just because the measurement tools that we have um, are the census. And so, you know, 2000, nothing, you know, sort of we start the world cleanly in, you know, in the census year, and then nothing happens. We can only check it 10 years later, right? It's entirely possible that the world is starting to change very rapidly, as we've seen, right, in the last several years in a number of communities here in DC um, and in a lot of other places. Um, community change doesn't necessarily start at the, at the, the, the decennial census, right? So 14, 15, 16, things are starting to pick up and may have in fact changed quite rapidly even three or four years later. And so the ability to kind of capture it in process uh, is limited on some level if you're only looking at these large national data sets. Um, so we did see also that these inconsistent definitions um, about gentrification can also impact where we think it's occurring. Um, and it includes, right, the impacts are about rising housing costs, displacement of existing residents, changes in crime rates, effects on school quality, and at best, some of this data is really just a proxy for what we're trying to capture, those impacts on the residents. And so the data doesn't always capture all of that. So it's really important um, to make sure that you're incorporating not only sort of the low-hanging data fruit, um, but really ensuring that you're capturing the lived experience of residents, that the, the experience of gentrification and of neighborhood change is as much about the lived experience, the fact that the corner store no longer carries the same products that I had, that the, they used to charge a you know, dollar for a cup of coffee, and now it's $3 for artisanal, what have you, right? So the, the cost of living in my community, right? And so you know, on paper, right, the, the ownership of, the, of that neighborhood store hasn't changed. The name on the store hasn't changed. Nothing in the sort of official data would indicate a change, but if you were to walk in, it would feel very, very different than it might have felt only a couple of months ago or certainly a couple of years ago. So getting better about incorporating the experience of residents into that conversation about how places are changing, I think is really critical to ensure that you're getting equitable outcomes in communities. Um, and it's particularly important for policymakers. It's important for investment uh, decisions as well. So, um, moving for the conversation forward from gentrification to neighborhood change, um, it's about responding to local concerns with local solutions, right? National level solutions aren't necessarily going to get you um, the kinds of answers or the questions that are really important. Um, and you need to sort of be mindful and actively engaged to address housing and community needs. Um, and it's really important to think holistically about promoting opportunity in all communities, not only the places that are changing um, upwards uh, in trajectory, but also places that are either staying stagnant, that have been stagnant for a long time, or are deteriorating. Investing in those communities is equally critical um, to ensure that there's a stable supply of affordable and accessible housing. So with that, I will wrap. Thank you. Andrew, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a few minutes here for a Q&A before we go to the third presentation. Are there any questions people have, other than everybody eager to go back and try out and see whether your neighborhood is officially gentrified <laughs> by one of these, uh, these measures? Or even eligible, right? Well, because some of you <laughs> probably wasn't eligible uh, ever. Um, but we have a question here. 
So we have Mike. You have Mike. Good. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Michael Martinez with American Express National Bank. Hey, I'm curious, um, what role, if any, does zoning play? And did you look at that at all? So we did not look at zoning. Uh, the Zoning is a unfortunately often a parallel conversation or a totally separate conversation, but it definitely plays in both in terms of what is developable um, and your sort of ability and willingness to use the land to its not only highest and best use, um, but also the pressures that it puts on affordability. So the inability to add to supply more generally uh, ultimately puts pressure on the existing stock to support the potentially a growing number of residents, right? Increased demand, not an increase in supply, sort of econ 101, uh, would tell you that prices are going to go up. Um, and so thinking about, again, sort of the ability to, for also for renters um, who are higher income to move into home ownership, uh, which has been stymied uh, quite a bit over the last decade or so, has also been one of the factors that's added to um, pressure on the rest of the rental population who don't have as much choice in where they can afford to live. And so um, zoning, which is unnecessarily keeping density down, right? The inability to develop particularly small size and medium size that are multifamily properties that really fit in with the neighborhoods in a lot of cases. Um, the inability to sort of build beyond single family or then sort of fight tooth and nail to get large scale multifamily developed um, has really led to a lack of um, supply that really serves the kind of vast middle of the housing market. Um, and one of the things that we do know is that small and medium multifamily properties, sort of anything from two to 49 units, um, that are not necessarily built with affordability in mind, but those are the properties that over time are most likely to filter down, again, to use the economics term, but basically become more affordable over time um, without subsidy. Um, and so recognizing the limits on the ability of availability of subsidy, um, it's really important that the housing market writ large can sort of develop more to meet supply, uh, to provide the supply necessary to really meet the demands in a different number of places, but zoning definitely overlays that. But it's important also to recognize that there is a substantial size of the set of, subset of the population that will require subsidy um, or assistance in some form or another, whether it's directly to them or to the owners or the stewards of the properties, um, to be able just to sort of meet the operating costs of those properties. Um, so I don't think just sort of, you know, liberalizing zoning isn't going to solve the housing problems that we're seeing. Um, you need both additional supply, but you also definitely need additional support. Andrew, so. thank you. That's a great segue to my presentation. Uh, but let's see if we have some more questions here. So we have, I'll come back to you, John. Let's go to another part of the room if there is one. Are there any questions in this in area? Back. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm Garth Riemann with the National Council of State Housing Agencies. There seems to be a lot of discussion about gentrification these days, specifically in the context of opportunity zones. And I just wondered if you think, <laughs> as a result of looking at this and thinking about it, whether there are any particular measures or concepts that may be particularly relevant for opportunity zones? So um, I think one of the challenges, again, sort of with opportunity zones is sort of the nature of the data and the speed at which we get sort of the meaningful data at the national level. So I think that it's really important in the context of opportunity zones, A, to sort of rule out the places that already under any of these definitions already have changed as the places where, you know, those are the, most likely the places where the market is already going to come in and the type of opportunity zone activity that you're going to see is basically deals that were going to happen anyway um, and now they're just getting a tax boost, you know, sort of a, a, return, a bonus on their yields. Right. Um, I think the places to really encourage greater um, investment that meet both the opportunity zone criteria and sort of capacity for change are the places where um, I think there's both greater risk that you might see non-mission oriented uh, activities, right? Sort of, you know, if you think about opportunity zones being kind of focused on creating opportunity for the residents, uh, of those communities, I think the play, there's a lot of opportunity zones where change is already kind of, the horse is already out of the barn. Um, but I think capturing the place, sort of focusing on the places where some additional capital could really move deals from being non-viable to viable, but are done with community development in mind, and thinking on opportunities to develop either small business activity, affordable housing, other community development facilities um, in those communities that might be at risk of change in a way that would be detrimental to the existing residents. I think that's where um, if the opportunity zone overlay uh, with some of these is really interesting, and that's some work that we're actually planning to look at over the summer is sort of how opportunity zones. Okay, I think we have uh, time if it's a quick question, John. Hi, uh, John Olson from Goldman Sachs. You mentioned a couple of weaknesses of the data. One is that it's so lagged. 
they're getting it so late. And the other is that it doesn't pick up those, those perceptions of people in the community of seeing their neighborhood change around them. So my question is, is there any movement in the research community to do more qualitative, you know, kind of interviews in neighborhoods, trying to pick, it, pick up these trends sooner and pick up those, those perceptions of gentrification? So there is. Um, I think that kind of the reliance only on sort of these large national data sets is actually detrimental for the reasons um, that, you, that you identify. And the ability to kind of incorporate local data sets, local knowledge, um, whether that's sort of administrative data that's only available in a particular geography, right? So um, if, for example, your particular city has good data on code enforcement and code violations, so you get a better sense of housing quality. Um, if you've got administrative data around school quality and things like so sort of other you know, indications of, indicators of retail sales, some of the things, but also figuring out for the community itself. So before you kind of jump straight into the data, convene a stakeholder group, talk to people who live in these communities that are, are at risk of change, and find out from them what they see as the challenges, and then figure out from those conversations what data would be needed to inform and sort of transform, translate from the qualitative and lived experience of the community residents into sort of a more replicable, uh, I don't want to say rigorous, because I think there is rigor that is done qualitatively as well, but a more replicable set of indicators um, that can be monitored at a more local level. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, let's thank Andrew. I'm just going back down there. Okay, so um, we may have time for a few more questions at the end, uh, but you can see as the moderator, my job is to keep us on, on time, so uh, I'll try and to do that. we set up the incentives correctly. <laughs> right, so that's, that's correct, right? All of you, <laughs> right. You wanna have the person taking the risk uh, be the person that has control, so uh, I, I needed to make sure there was time for, at least for my presentation, so. <laughs> Bankers will all appreciate that uh, analysis here. So, um, what I'm going to talk about something is uh, hopefully something that will be fun for you to work with, but also a very useful tool for you to take back to your communities uh, where uh, local, uh, to your local communities where affordable housing is a real challenge. And uh, to start out, I just want to point out that there really are two kinds of or two sources of affordable housing challenges. One is income. Uh, we might uh, unfairly uh, 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 use the example again of Detroit. I don't think there's a shortage of housing in Detroit, uh, but there is a, sh uh, a lack of income and a lack of demand because uh, there's so many few people living there. Uh, and there are other, at the other uh, source, and some cities have both, uh, is really high demand that uh, we found uh, uh, quite uh, interestingly. We all used to sit here and all talk about inner cities and uh, the uh, death of cities uh, many years ago and now many cities uh, and certainly many neighborhoods in cities are extremely popular. Uh, and so this increased demand is part of what uh, uh, Andrew, I think, uh, uh, was talking about uh, here. And I'm glad at least, Andrew, you cited uh, one of the works by uh, two of my uh, colleagues at the Furman Center. So uh, uh, it is a very difficult uh, uh, issue here about what is gentrification and uh, it is a very personal one. I think as well, so uh, talking uh, in the community to people. So uh, in order to think about this second, which is the highlight uh, that we have about cities that are facing rapidly rising housing costs or neighborhoods that are facing or that have high housing costs, uh, what can they do? Uh, and so uh, we uh, put together what's called a community of uh, practice, uh, 14 experts from across the country to help us uh, think through this uh, problem and how we can create a website that would be helpful. Uh, so uh, I'm not seeing the top of uh, this uh, screen well. Anyway, there's, there is a, um, what's called an eyebrow at the top and it can tell you about how this was put together with these experts from across the country and also an advisory uh, uh, group of over 40 national organizations that gave us feedback over three years. So this had created um, uh, a tool that uh, has over 150 documents in the back of it that uh, very light on the front, and I'll hopefully show you that so that you can uh, get into, into it, uh, and, and lays out 82 policies that localities can use to help 
deal with this uh, affordable ho housing challenge of how to preserve uh, the affordable housing that exists and to create uh, more of it. So um, uh, it's aimed for all levels of experience, all sizes of cities, uh, all levels of knowledge, uh, so that if somebody's just starting out, there's a part of this website uh, that will be extremely helpful to them about how to think about that. And I'm going to, again, um, uh, take you through the, uh, uh, some of this so that you can uh, see, uh, see more carefully. The key message here is that uh, localities need to have a comprehensive and balanced uh, housing strategy. You can't just do zoning, but you can't not do zoning. Uh, you can't just help people stay in their homes, any displacement, but you also need to encourage more development uh, to try and uh, uh, meet the supply. So there is this basic uh, policy framework of four, um, what I call four pillars, and that is uh, in the situation where you have high uh, housing costs and high demand, uh, you need to build more affordable housing. I think all of you know that cost of housing, uh, cost of construction makes building new affordable housing very expensive. Uh, it requires subsidy. That's something that the uh, government uh, needs to do. It's not going to happen naturally. Filtering down isn't really happening in cities uh, that are uh, both what we used to call superstar cities, four or five, but quite honestly, I'm sure in almost every locality or many localities you're working, you're finding that affordable housing has become a key local political issue. It's really, over the years we've worked on this, just amazing how many mayors now talk about affordable housing. Uh, and even we have some national uh, candidates uh, uh, that are talking about it. Uh, so it, you need to build more subsidized affordable housing. The federal government is not there to help expand that. Uh, and hopefully we can hold on to the programs that uh, we have. Uh, so here, localities need to play an active role. They need to play an active role in expanding the overall supply of housing, because if you don't increase the supply, then all those people who want to move in, all those college graduates uh, who maybe are earning income, maybe not, but uh, will, uh, <laughs> in the, if they're not, they're all uh, four to a, a one bedroom or something, uh, who are uh, putting uh, pressure on, on the housing stock will raise the cost of what is now uh, uh, affordable housing to be much less affordable. You need to help people stay in their homes, any displacement, any harassment, uh, and you need to help people find good quality housing in the private housing market. So that underlying uh, framework is here. So um, <clears throat> this website, you see all these tiles on the front, um, and I'm gonna just uh, take us through to give a sense. So let's just say you could wake up some morning and uh, you're really worried about uh, uh, displacement. So uh, you can go to the tile about uh, issues and we can uh, tap on displacement. And oh, we see that there's a brief on displacement. There is a list of uh, housing policies that uh, can help deal with displacement. Um, and there uh, are um, some other resources here. So before I take us into the brief, um, uh, I, you get a little introduction here, so I don't bury you immediately in all the details, but uh, here's uh, some ideas about uh, what to do about housing uh, stability. Uh, we can then take you uh, more deeply into the topic. Um, if I, for you know, a fairly extensive uh, discussion of what, what that is. And so that's pretty typical of what you'll uh, find here in terms of being able to delve deeply. I mentioned before about um, that uh, we've worked with a, a, a large advisory council, so we're not trying to reinvent all the work that good people have done out there. Uh, so this is a central source for you then to uh, link to a lot of other uh, pieces, uh, a lot of other research that's, in, that, that's been done. So uh, let me go uh, a little easier when I can see and don't have bright lights in my eyes. Uh, <clears throat> if you have a policy that you're interested, you can go tap that, um, uh, that tile. Mm -hmm. Again, you get a nice uh, drop-down box. And here, uh, uh, density bonuses, I'll just pick one here if you're and then you can go, there's a whole overview here, 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's in the right-hand column. It's those four pillars, uh, but I'll show you them in a different way in the little house uh, icon. Um, and um, again, an introduction, and then you can learn more uh, by clicking there. There are some examples, and that's something we're uh, continuing to build of what cities have, uh, have actually done, other cities have done, and uh, there's also a list of uh, related resources. So all of this is designed to make it really easy <coughs> for you to find whatever material um, uh, you're looking for. So here's examples, sorry. And then there's some related resources. All of this is we're continuing to, to build out. Um, I, I, I guess I'll take the opportunity here to note at the bottom uh, there actually is a place that uh, you can click on to send feedback about this page. So if you're working on it, it doesn't uh, uh, give you some information or it doesn't give you enough information or you have some other resources you think should be noted on it. Uh, we really would value this. It's, this is a living document, literally, and uh, we can uh, use all the, all the help we can do, uh, all, all the help that we can get uh, to do that. So just taking us back again to the home page. Um, so if you, uh, uh, as I said, this is also for people who are just starting out. So this tile in the lower left-hand corner called Learning the Basics actually takes you a bunch of videos. Um, what is uh, affordable housing? Why is the housing affordable? This is one of those you know, revelatory moments that with our experts, one of the uh, um, people in the community of practice was a city council, is a city council person from uh, Denver. Um, and she said, you know, every time we get some new political leader here, this is what they ask, you know, tell me, <laughs> I know there's a problem, but what is it? Why is housing unaffordable? And uh, these are all uh, short videos uh, in this day and age. Ex uh, attention, expand, um, uh, attention span lasts uh, for about three minutes, and so they're all about three minutes in length. So this is a video, I'm not gonna take the time to do that. Uh, there's also a script there, so for people who uh, wanna see the words, but so um, again, an introduction uh, for people to uh, learn more uh, who are just starting out. Um, so again, for this, you deal in cities of all, and communities of all different sizes, and uh, some have less capacity, less uh, experience uh, than others. So uh, this next uh, tile, learn how to uh, create a comprehensive housing strategy, um, is all about planning. Um, so it has, what is the local housing strategy? Why is it important? Uh, taking a balanced approach to new development. Um, skip comprehensive and balanced. Uh, addressing segregation by income. Some basic issues that you need to think about uh, when you're putting together um, a plan. For those who uh, are starting out in, and um, barely know the population of their city and a few other basic facts, we actually have a pr pretty uh, clever tool here uh, called Assess Your Local Housing Strategy. So there's a short version, again, for people who ha don't have a lot of time, and a long version, and um, putting in some basic facts here, uh, you can get back his ideas of what elements of a comprehensive plan uh, uh, would, would look like. Uh, you get a uh, PDF at the end and print out. Uh, it doesn't tell you all the detail that you need to do, but gives you a, a sense of uh, the kinds of policies um, uh, that you should be looking at. So uh, I've, I've saved a little bit for last here. Uh, this uh, bullet in the lower, um, a tile in the lower right hand corner called Browse the Full Site. Uh, you've probably been noticing along the way here that uh, on the left-hand side, there's a bunch of what I call verbs. Uh, it's another navigation tool. So we talk about uh, learn and plan uh, through those other tiles. But this, uh, this explains all the other verbs uh, that you see all the time. So when you're working uh, within the website, you can go back and forth amongst these categories. So we talked about land and plan. Uh, analyzes, you know, how do I know what our local housing needs are? So, it's a little slow here. Sorry. Yeah, it's not going to do me what I need. Um, it's always interesting. Uh, so, in here are three uh, 
data tools. The first is housing needs assessment, how to assess, and I'll show you that a little bit more of that in a second. Um, and this next one I particularly like for those of you who are on the, particularly on the lending side or uh, worry about real estate development, ga uh, gauging development feasibility. So it tells what a pro forma is and why it's important to understand the economics. If you're designing policy and you're working with developers, you've got to get the math right. And so uh, this is actually you know, a beginning explanation of, of how that um, works. But let's go uh, to the housing needs assessment tool. So what we do here is, um, help you analyze all of these questions here. What's the adequacy of housing production? What's, uh, what's the stock of dedicated affordable housing? What's uh, the situation with regard to rental affordability? So let me just pick the first one here, adequacy of housing pr production. And we, we talk about what are key data points. All these, on, on almost all cases, this data is national data, so you don't need anything special, but in some cases, local administrative data can take you a lot further. And this is just the beginning here, but. Uh, it's always dangerous to use New York as an example, so I apologize for that, but uh, we thought it would be helpful if people could see exactly how to take the data and put it together. So this is, uh, shows how to knit the data together and shows the, uh, what we call visualizations here. So this is one of my favorite, uh, just because most people think about populations growing, therefore we need more housing. Population can grow any faster than the housing stock grows unless you had lots of vacancy or you have more homeless. So what really matters is an uh, indicator of demand is not just that the, 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 your housing stock is increasing, but that local employment is increasing. So you can see the, the line at the top really shows where all the pressure is coming from, in, uh, in this case, New York City. The key point of, of having this is that somebody who wants to do it for their locality uh, can see what it would look like, at least this form of visualization. There are all sorts of different ways to visualize the data. Um, but what we also uh, do here uh, is have a, a how-to section, which is how do you interpret the New York City data uh, for whatever value that is, but then how do you construct it? Where do you find the data um, and uh, that you can use uh, to create exactly this kind of a visualization and this kind of story for your, uh, for your locality. Um, <clears throat> next is, is ACT, and, and under there is this housing policy framework that I mentioned before. So the four pillars of you need to build, create, and preserve more uh, affordable housing. Uh, you need to promote more uh, supply in general. You need to help households uh, uh, access and afford their private market homes, and you need to protect people help them stay in their home uh, to protect against displacement and, and poor housing conditions. Um, the remainder of these, these are all talked about under browse, as I said before, but now I'm just using the left-hand column. Um, you know, <clears throat> funding, what can localities do to generate uh, funds here, as well as make sure you're using the federal uh, programs wisely. Refine um, is all about trade-offs. So, you know, should we do more home ownership or more rental? What income levels? All the kinds of dilemmas that you know that localities face in terms of thinking about where to devote their uh, resources. So, discussion uh, of that. Uh, bridges, uh, bridges, another fun one uh, because I think we all know that now housing alone isn't changing, uh, going to change communities. You need to talking about education and public safety and health and all of those issues. And those creating natural bridges to other advocacy areas and uh, in the case of healthcare, even, even other sources of financing. So thinking in terms of developing your local housing strategy, you need to think about all of these other areas as well and uh, potential allies to, to work with. And then for whatever wasn't in everything else, um, we have an, the area called um, Explore. And that uh, has lots of links uh, under all these uh, topics. So uh, within the uh, related resources, within ind individual documents, we don't always have all the links. But you can go to Explore and say, here's a topic I'm interested in, and then uh, have fun going across the internet looking at different analyses that people have done are different ways to, to think about it. So um, 
But that's a quick overview. I guess I should mention two things. If all else fails, uh, now I see the eyebrows up there now. Uh, there's a search function, and it works. Um, uh, the about, I mentioned before, will tell you a little bit of history about the community of practice. Um, and the other thing is you can actually create your own notebook. So um, we want you to come in, sign up. Uh, we're not selling anything. We're not selling your name. Um, but if you do do that and you want to preserve certain uh, locations here, you can put them uh, on documents. You can put them in your notebook and come back any time and find those documents uh, in, your own, uh, in your own notebook. So we like to think we've created something that's very usable. We've gotten a lot of very excited reactions from people. Uh, it's not going to design your local housing strategy, but it can really help you get there. Um, for those of you who are interested, I left some cards outside that uh, a little propaganda on local housing solutions. So uh, uh, hopefully you'll all give it a try, and hopefully it will be uh, really, really helpful to you uh, in the work that you do in your communities. So thank you. So as moderator, I've managed to leave a couple minutes for questions. So we have one back here. And, and the questions can be to all three of us, as it happens, right? OK, but please, let's get the microphone there. This is a really straightforward question. How, okay. What is your plan to keep that updated? Uh, a lot of work. Yeah. So uh, uh, <clears throat> for those who uh, depend on philanthropic support, we got uh, major support from uh, Ford and MacArthur, both of whom are out of this business. So it's kind of ironic that uh, that's where we find ourselves, but we have found other funders and we are continuing to maintain it and build on it. We want to do more case histories. We're thinking about creating actually a um, academic curriculum. Uh, we're working with National League of Cities and other organizations like that to, to have educational uh, seminars. So, if you're on a, a board and you want us to do a webinar for your members, we're very happy to do that. Uh, we are also will come to a conference, particularly if you'll pay us, not here, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, to come and uh, run a little uh, uh, training. So all of this review is part of building a lot more knowledge out there. Right? Um, you know, as I said before, 15 years ago, maybe in many cases 10 years ago, no one was worried about high housing costs in the way that we're now seeing with increased popularity of city and urban living uh, that uh, we're getting. So we, th we thought this was a, a niche market, but it turns out to be uh, a, a bigger, uh, bigger than that. Um, any other questions? OK, we have a question right here. Raise your hand a little higher so we can see you. I can barely see you, but. Carrie Holloway, Bank of New York Mellon. As a CRA banker, we are encouraged to support nonprofit organizations to get our service credit. So my question is, how can data be um, conveyed to the community so that grassroots organizations can take advantage of the information and the data that's being developed and that they can be essentially providers of information and purveyors of information about gentrification and about change in the neighborhoods. I'm going to let my uh, colleagues here uh, speak about that, but this here is hopefully helpful because yeah. making you more aware of it than you can help the groups that you work with be more aware of what the resources are out there. You want to, enterprise obviously plays a key role in this. Sure, I'll, I'll, um, yeah, we've actually been working with a number of different um, university-based research institutions, and I think actually the Firm Center is a good example, and this kind of work mm -hmm. is really helpful. Um, but I think that they that really are starting to do a lot of work with sort of that local administrative data, but also doing a lot of community outreach and engagement to train community residents on both data collection and using sort of available software tools to kind of collect community conditions that sort of then flow in to a data set that then is sort of curated by these research institutions. Uh, we've been doing some work, for example, uh, down in Atlanta with folks at Georgia Tech um, in their computer science department that has a really strong mandate for civic engagement and democratization of data, not only the dissemination of the data itself, but also the collection of that data. Um, and so finding those partners not only who have sort of the, the boots on the ground to go collect that data, but also sort of the, 
local standing to be the curator of those data sets and the capacity to manage that data, it's not easy. Um, but finding those research partnerships uh, and those community partnerships, it's sort of a, I guess, a three-part uh, relationship. But you've got both the organizations that have the, the outreach um, and then the capacity to, to do that, that data work. Um, I think is there have been some significant strides forward. I, I, a lot of I, places on that. I think that you can register for uh, getting information here, right? Sign up uh, for this kind of work that you are doing yeah. when you're putting out new data and stuff. Yeah, uh, we can. I can certainly happily. And, and Laurie at the Urban Institute obviously yeah. is really yeah. focused on that. Do you want to add anything? Well, yeah, uh, no. Um, so um, we do a lot of that kind of work as well, and I think you know. Sort of the trick is sort of being well defined in terms of what you're trying to accomplish so you can actually figure out exactly what data is needed and standardize the approach. So if you're doing it across a number of communities, your approach is kind of standardized so you get comparable information. Okay, I've been giving the uh, cut sign here. Uh, we're down to just a few few more seconds. So we're all going to be here for a while and be happy to take any questions and be helpful. Uh, okay, but it's got to be very brief. All right. Hi, Abhishek Mitra, U.S. Bank. Um, Great. So when Great. we talk about the conversation around equity and recently, we talk about it through right. pathways to accumulate wealth where there haven't been before. Right. Um, has, the, um, has your uh, work looked at sort of the impact of oversubsidizing communities and you know, whether that is detrimental to the accumulation of wealth in areas where there hasn't been, like whether it be through investments in, you know, low-income housing tax credits or lending. I'm just curious to know, like, what kind of work has there been around sort of the uh, understanding whether we are really right. doing right by our investments? So um, I think that's a great question. Uh, a lot of the research at the Furman Center is on that topic, and so I'd be happy to chat with you separately about that. I, uh, Andrew's looking here as if yeah, there's I mean, something I, is, to say there. And uh, Opportunity Zones is an excellent example of overinvesting in. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll just sort of highlight some work that we did uh, that the um, sort of forthcoming in the next What Works book from the San Francisco Fed, but the Case Western Reserve is already sort of compiling them and putting them out, looking at the impact of um, sort of the way in which LIHTC impacts communities. Uh, we find positive uh, spillover effects, um, and the best way to achieve sort of mixes of incomes is probably not within a single building, um, with sort of like deep, sort of a, a wide disparity, um, but really to focus the subsidy on the folks who really need it. I think the danger comes when you sort of subsidize folks who are gonna do the thing that they would end up doing anyway. So I think, you know, Opportunity Zones is potentially a cautionary tale on that. Anyway, so, uh, there's a lot of work yeah. in that area. I'd be happy to talk more about it. A lot of very good thoughts going, going on there. So I, I am definitely over. So I don't know, am I turning this to you, Buzz? What am I doing at this moment? Oh, you're on break. Okay, all right. So thank you all very much. Thank our panel.